At Work Australia would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and pay our respect to Elders past and present. This podcast is being recorded in the southwest and Western Australia, which is land of the Noongar people. We'd also like to pay our respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from wherever you may be listening from. Hello and welcome everyone to a special edition of Canned Conversations with Sean. In this episode, we chat with one of At Work Australia's Indigenous Connections team members to discuss NAIDOT Week, what it means to him and what he's most proud of about being an Indigenous man. I really enjoyed my conversation with Kale and learning more about his cultural background. Really hope you enjoy this episode and as always, to find out more information, please check out the links in the show notes. Thanks so much, mate, for coming along today to join us for this special episode as we're going to be reflecting on NAIDOC week and we celebrate and recognise the history, the culture and the achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So thanks, thanks for taking the time. No worries, no worries. Thanks for the invite. I'm happy to be here and I feel like it's going to be a good experience overall. It's going to be yeah, good. Yeah, no, I'm looking looking to learn a bit more about yourself, the journey you've been on, um, the role you're working in now, and get to know a bit about your cultural background as well. First up, if you don't mind, I just want to have a little bit of a chat about NAIDOC week. So this year, the theme chosen by the National NAIDOC committee is Keep the Fire Burning Black Loud and Proud. The theme honours the the enduring strengths and vitality of First Nations culture, um, with, with fire being a symbol of of connection to country, to it, to yeah. each other, and to the rich tapestry of tradition that defines Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Given the theme of NAIDOC Week this year, can I start by asking, what makes you most proud to be an Indigenous man? Well, for me, being an Indigenous man, I love the togetherness, uh, the passion. Um, I also love how family orientated it is. Um, you know that with working and stuff, it makes it a lot easier because I am so relate. I'm related to everyone in my town, and uh, you know it's been good so far. Um, with helping all these clients, you know, all the family do what they want to do and stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah. Overall, I reckon the most probably be the the. the passion and the family orientated you know how much everyone sort of is intertwined even though we're sort of like whether it'll be like six cousins or you might be my third i don't know auntie on my dad's side you know so like the family orientated everyone loves and the respect we have for each other is just crazy yeah. which is which makes the work a lot more enjoyable and easier as well so doesn't matter how far down the bloodline you're connected family's family doesn't matter if you're a fifth cousin or sixth cousin <laughs> Yeah. same as your first yeah brother you know I like especially like with working here I've, I've found I've met a lot more of my family and stuff whether it be out in the smaller regional towns um, or whether it be uh, in northern you know which is great and it was really um, a really really great experience just yep. to be able to work with them and help them grow yeah no and yeah. so NAIDOC week provides a great opportunity for all Australians to learn more about First Nations people could you mind sharing more about your cultural background what region do you come from and what's the traditional name of your people Yep, so uh, where my dad's from, which is northern, uh, which is about 90 k's east going out to Kalgoorlie, out of Perth, um, and the traditional name, we call it our Baladong area, but we're all classified as like Nyungas, that's the people, that's what our people are called, but that area is called Baladong. And yeah, my mum's family, she comes from Geraldton, and the land we call, it's called Wamajari, so I just... I've had to remember that and the language we speak up there or the people we call ourselves Yamaji. So I'm a Yamaji and a Nyunga and yeah, it's it's good. And where does um where's the border? Where does that transition from? Where do they switch? Or how? Because I'm I'm in the southwest as well. Where does oh, okay. how far how far north do the, do the Nunga people go? So there's Mora. So Mora is in between throughout the country. It's called Yuit, which is Y-U-E-D. And that's in between our Nyunga, Baladong area and our Wamajari area. And um, about, I think it starts from about Pier Wanning or something, one of the smaller towns. And then it goes on to Yuit country, which is Mora, Durian Bay, Cervantes. Yeah. When then it goes up to my mum's country, yeah, our Yamaji country. 
is NAIDOC week celebrated within your family? Well, it means um, celebrating just the his not the history, the culture, um, how far we have come, you know, um, being able to go out and run stalls and stuff and get family involved, you know, and get all these different type of vendors with our Indigenous peoples involved, you know, which I think was great. Like last year, we had, uh, the theme for NAIDOC was our people. And um, we had, uh, we had uh, one of our cousins who works in our Albany office, he was coming up to do dancing and stuff and play the didge with a yeah. couple of the boys. And I got in there and did a couple of dances and, you know, and we told a bit of stories and stuff and took photos. So, like, it's really family orientated and, you know, it gives the opportunity for non-Indigenous people to celebrate the culture as well, you know, and learn a bit more about the history as well. So yeah. that's really good. Yeah, I know you just mentioned sharing stories. I know storytelling is a big part of the um, Aboriginal culture. Yeah. Um, growing up, is there any Dreamtime stories or that your elders used to share with you? Yeah, well, this was probably the main story that I got told when I was young. It's a story of the Woggle or the Rainbow Serpent, you know. Um, this is, was We classify this as the creator of the lands, you know, and we say he was the brightest star in the sky. This is how the story starts. He was the brightest star in the sky and one day he came down to the earth and as he came down and slithered through the earth, mountains rose up on the side of him and hills and as those mountains rose then streams became and rivers and all those things and now we say that he has he is laying in the river like in what we call the Baladong River here um in northern we say he lays there resting and we sort of like I've sort of had experiences where uh you sort of like had it like you think like oh this might be like real you know yeah. um because we have like a swimming hole just out of town called Burlong you know and all the family goes there, especially when it gets just going into summer. It's not summer, spring, sorry. Um, we yep. go out there and go swimming and, you know, have a good time. And then there's a little drop-off area where it just goes really deep and you don't know why it's like that deep. It's really crazy and you're thinking, oh, this looks out, might be something down there, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that was probably one of the main stories that i got told growing up one of the first actually yeah. and i'm not sure but do you have children of your own no not yet not yet, not yet. <laughs> do you think one day that you know would you continue to share these stories with your children as well Oh, definitely. You know, um, that's like our traditions, you know, you don't even mean to do it. It just happens. My uncles did it with me when we used to go, like, go out, do our things, our bush. After a long day of whatever it may be we were doing, we go and have a yarn, make a fire and start talking about the old stories, you know, of our old people and some of the things that they used to have to do and stuff like that. And yeah, just being able to acknowledge that yeah it's been a good and i probably will pass those on to my kids when when when, when i do the, have when the day so. comes when the yeah. day comes yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah well that sort of segues into my next question within your family do you still have any of them old cultural traditions that you still continue to do today yeah, so, you know, when I when I first started off, because I grew up in the city a bit when I was younger, but as I came to Northern, you know, I, my uncles taught me uh, how to walk the bush. This was the, probably the starting before you're able to actually go hunting. You have to walk the bush so you know, like, where kangaroos sit and, like, their habits and stuff, you know. And um, after that, they're being able to hunt, shoot guns and stuff and um, learning how to skin kangaroos and using the fur to make fur pelts and stuff. It's it's really good, you know, and I don't think I would have uh, learnt any of this if I was in the city and I'm glad for all my uncles and nephews and stuff. What did they teach you to look out for when you're looking for where kangaroos sit and looking for their tracks and things? you got to make sure that you're spread out in the whole bush because, as you know, there'll be like, like it's like a reserve sort of. So we have to walk in a straight line, probably about 50 metres apart, and you have to make sure that there are no kangaroos coming towards you because we're trying to herd them all towards our uncles who are waiting at the end of the bush ready to shoot and for a feed, you know. So probably, you know, that there, like knowing where, where to go, uh, where to look, 
and where to walk and making sure you're keeping that line when you walk in the bush. Yeah, okay. So there's it's like a, it's a team effort. Everyone's sort of forcing it like a, you're herding the kangaroos yeah. or the animal into the direction you, you, yeah. you want them to move in. Yeah, so that was probably the main skills, you know, as a 13-year-old boy, you know, getting dropped off at the end of a bush and you're like, where is everyone? It's like a real nerve-wracking experience, but overall, you know, it's good because at the end of it, you're like, oh, you know, kangaroos, and then you've got food and, yeah. Do you start wondering if you're walking in the right direction? You can't sort <laughs> yeah. of see everyone else you're with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done that a couple times, you know, and like you hear gunshots going off in the in the background, and you're like, "Where's that coming from?" So you're ducking, and <laughs> yeah, it's like, "Oh damn, where?" Yeah. Do you ever was, get lost? Nah, you know, I'm glad because my uncles, they, you know, I always had the thought in my head, you know, I probably am going to get lost. I probably am lost at the moment. And then, but my uncles always knew like, oh, the bush is this big and this says how much people we put in. And then, you know, if you stay where you're, where we told you to go, then, you know, we'll find you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So basically that's how it was. And, you know, it was really, really funny. Good, good experience. If you don't listen, it's your own fault if you get lost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. And, like, back in the day, I had cousins and stuff where, like, they would shoot kangaroos out in a paddock and then we would have to get off the back of the ute to go and get the kangaroo out in the paddock when then you might get left there and it'll probably be like eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night, and the car's just gone chasing this other kangaroo, and you're like, "Are they coming back?" <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah. you started to mention before about making didgeridoos as well. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so uh, in my old job, I was actually a bush ranger. Um, so we dealt a lot with um, going out into the bush, um, dealing with dieback and all those things, and reseeding. Uh, the areas and stuff for farmers whether like if they cleared off a bunch of land then we would go out and re replant the whole area and in those times there I learned how to make didgeridoos working with uh, some of the other indigenous groups down south there it's a really good experience a bit hard to be honest at the start but I think I became a professional uh, a little bit into it so it was a good you know you have to make sure that the tree is the right size and then you have to make sure the mouth of the tree is like a big so then the sound comes out good there has to be no cracks in the wood uh it has to be like eaten out by the termites so we use a stick to tap on the side of the wood to make sure that it's hollow all the way up and then once we know it's hollow then we cut it out of the ground and dry it out for a couple of weeks and if it needs to be hollowed out a bit more then we usually use a drill or something like that there yeah. and then yeah get the painting and varnishing and stuff probably lucky these days you can get the drill to make the job easier but i'm assuming yeah. your uncles back in the day wouldn't have had oh, that had that um opportunity oh yeah like um he was exp like one of the uncles was telling me back in the day they had to make fires to use the fire and then use the fire to hollow burn out the insides to make it dry and then they would go in with like chisels and stuff to like hollow it out and i was like that sounds like a lot more work than what they do today you know yeah. the process there's like extra five steps and stuff i was like that's crazy yeah. But well, you can see how far, like, the culture has gone, you know, from these times to these times. Yeah. And so do you still regularly meet with elders within your community? Yeah, all the time, you know, because I'm related to everyone. I'm probably, Northern is a small town. And because majority of, we, the biggest caseload we have is in the wheat belt, you know, and majority of the wheat belt I'm related to. So always, whenever I'm going down the main street, you know, I'll see family, whether it be uncles, aunties, or nan and pops, and I'll stop and have a yarn with them and stuff just to see how yeah. they're going. And, and they always see me and then, and they always like, oh, that's good what you're doing, you know. We need more people, like, to help out with getting our Indigenous people into work or even progressing in life, just progressing in general, you know. And I think yeah. that's what they, they see what I'm doing and it makes them happy, you know. Yeah, that's great. And now, so let's shift the conversation and we can talk more about what you're doing now. So you're an um, Indigenous Connections job coach. Can you tell us a bit more about your role with At Work Australia and what that involves? Yep. Uh, so basically, I started my role about a year ago now, um, and I help out all Indigenous clients on our caseload in our wheat belt area. 
area to get job ready or just to progress them to getting job ready, you know, whether that be like getting them ID, like learners, licenses, birth certificates, anything like that there, just progressing them because a lot of our Indigenous people don't have learners licenses and stuff like that there so just being able to help with those things have really been able to open up more avenues for the clients as well and um we all i also help out with getting our clients into like courses like certificates and programs like that whether that be internally with us where we run it in the office like our traffic management course we're running next week i'm helping people get into that uh just so they have a bit more qualification whether that be going to tafe like one of um, i'm helping one of the job coaches with our, one of our indigenous clients he wants to do horticulture so we're trying to get him up at the tafe just to build on all their experiences gain more qualifications and really giving them that personalised assistance, I guess. Everyone needs support in their own ways. They need about a tailor the service to suit yes. the individual's needs. Yeah. And tell me about the community engagement side of your role. How does that? How do you enjoy that? So I'm glad because I grew up in Northern. I took, like I played all my sports and stuff. So as I transitioned into this type of work, it really made it easier just to even go out to these businesses and have these conversations because I've had that um, rapport with all these people in the community, you know, whether it be our, uh, in our Indigenous vendors or whether it be our non-Indigenous vendors. It's been, been good, you know, and it's been a good as in my role, I'm allowed to do these types of things where I can go out and sort of create that rapport with these um, businesses and stuff and start to create like some sort of programs or things like whether we can help each other out. So it's been good in yeah. that sense, you know, it's been able to open a lot more doors and we have been able to do a lot more things with it. So it's been yeah, good. That sounds like you're doing some really great work there. In your experience, what do you think some of the main barriers that Indigenous people face when it comes to trying to find employment? So speaking from my experience, I felt um, I had my, just for like licenses and learners and stuff like that, I spent probably about easily seven years to get my license. And I feel that's the same for a lot of our Indigenous and non-Indigenous clients, you know, Um, especially out in the more rural areas in those smaller towns and stuff you know yeah because you know majority of our indigenous clients live in this small town querying which is about an hour away from northern you know and that's about the same distance from northern to perth and that's a long way to go and a lot of them don't have transport or licenses or stuff to be able to make it to these programs that we're holding or they don't have have the assistance to be able to come into the office for these things that we're running you know I think that's probably the biggest barrier, I would say, for progressing our Indigenous clients to employment. Yeah. And how do you think we can overcome these barriers that just by taking the service out to their communities and supporting them to be able to get these licences and gaining qualifications? Yep, so we actually had a sort of a thing, we were doing a Cert 3 at the moment, a Cert 3 in civil construction and plan operations, and um, a lot of the clients didn't have, they were doing all their theory work in town, so a lot of them were able to make it into town, so they'd be able to do all their book work and stuff, all their theory work, and then as they started transitioning into that more practical side of it, where where they're jumping on like the loaders and then your excavators, your bobcats and stuff, um, where they where they was doing all the practical work a lot of them couldn't get out there so we try to organize like a bus or a car or something like a work car just to be able to help them because like as i said before it is a lot of money to pay for taxis and stuff all the time you know and just to have that one thing just solidified so we'll be able to help i think the transport thing would probably be the biggest issue facing our indigenous clients at the moment yep for sure yeah and just for context for people who might be listening, um, the wheat belt is such a large area. I think it's um, where does where does the wheat belt span from? So it's not oh. really possible to get taxis to, between towns. Yeah. It's just that yeah. spread out. Yeah. So we're the great. So the area that we're in, we're called the Great Southern Wheat Belt. So we have the Great Southern and the Wheat Belt. So it runs from greatest area of our Indigenous clients. It runs from Northern up to Mora. 
uh, down to across to Southern Cross, you know, in the Meriden area um, with our at work office out there and then it goes down to like Narragin and then Albany you know that's like hours in between towns that yeah. people don't essentially have the transport to get there you know and I think just identifying that would be uh, just the next step forward you know just identifying yeah. that and yeah and if we look at the em- employer space what do you think employers can do to make their workplace more inclusive for Indigenous people? This is what I was trying to do uh, last year with my old boss. We was trying to get some cultural awareness training, um, whether it be run by someone like from the community, from their community. As you know, like every place is going to be different. Northern isn't the same as Albany and Albany isn't the same as Mora, you know. So we really want to tailor the cultural awareness training to the area um, just so people get a better understanding of the types of things that are allowed and aren't allowed. I think that would help get everyone sort of on the same page and hopefully everyone a better understanding as well. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, education is the way forward. If people have a better understanding of the reasons why people with different cultural backgrounds and it's going to be able to better create a more inclusive environment. Yeah, for sure. And And I think that's just identifying that and uh, starting to make progress with that would definitely make the whatever business more inclusive and more happy i guess yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and just to fin- finish off on a bit more of a, a lighter note i know in a previous conversation you mentioned you're a bit of a sports fan um oh, yeah. do you have any favorite in- indigenous athletes that you sort of throughout oh, your life where do we start oh, okay. what's, your, what's your favorite code what what what, what do you follow uh, I follow AFL mainly. I go for Essendon, um, Essendon Bombers, up the Bombers, uh, everyone out having there. A, having, a, having a good season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, number four. I'm glad um, we're in the office, you know. We have a lot of other brother boys and um, my regional manager, she goes for Collingwood and stuff. And last year when Collingwood was in the grand final, I sent my cousin a message, uh, Bobby Hill, you know, and I said, hey, Bob, this, oh, is, yeah. this is, she She loves Collingwood, you know, and then he was like, that's mad. So, it was, yeah, it was a good experience overall. And when he's on the big stage, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, that that's, that's yeah, he's gone yeah. good, yeah. Yeah, probably Bobby, you know, McDonald, Tip and Woody. He also played for Essendon. Paddy Mills, he plays for the Atlanta Hawks in yeah, the NBA. Yeah. Greg plays English. for the Australian team as well. <laughs> yeah, the Australian team. Now I hope they're crushing it. You know, they won against China, yeah. which is like, yeah, we're, yeah. Going, we're going good, you know. It's like going to be crazy, but yeah. No, there's def- definitely been some incredible talent um, through, throughout the years, and I, th- I think Paddy Mills would have to be one of my favourites as well. He does. Oh, yeah. He represents Australia incredibly well in the yeah. NBA, and when he comes back and play at the Olympics as well. So yeah, definitely. Thanks so much today for coming to join, Mikhail. I really appreciate having this conversation and learning about a bit more about your culture and y- your journey with Atwork Australia. No worries, Sean. Thanks for the invite. I'm glad to spread a bit more knowledge and hopefully uh, in, the, in the long term we can start addressing some of these, start working together and make it better for everyone. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in for our special edition for Candid Conversation with Sean to recognise NAIDOC Week. I really hope you enjoyed the conversation with Kale. And as always, to learn more or get more information about whatever we talked about in the episode, please refer to the links in the show notes. Mm-hmm.